Praise God. Well, my wife and I, are, Annette and I, are so excited to be back here at Shekinah Worship Center. Um, this is an amazing church. I know you guys know that, but we are always so blessed to come here. And we deeply love Pastor Joe and Melinda. They're amazing people of God. Uh, they truly walk in holiness, walk in the fear of the Lord, and we love them so much. Uh, you know, whenever I think of Pastor Joe, I, I always picture the pure white snow. Uh, no, he just, he's just so pure. And uh, they're, I say they're two of the most godly people we have ever known. So I am very, very honored to be in his pulpit. Amen. Amen. And thank you for joining us online. So um, anyway, my wife and I are excited again to be here. But, uh, you know, I had a message all prepared to speak to you on. And the Lord said, no, that's not it. So after I did all this work and preparation. <laughs> but he told me to share with you, um, and I know I shared this once before, but to share with you the vision God gave me of 23 Minutes in Hell that I wrote about in my book. So because, you know, we're living in, I believe, the last days, and there's a lot of misconceptions out there about hell, number one. There's people that believe in universalism or annihilationism, soul sleep, many false teachings. And also, there's a lot of people really in fear today and in confusion. I mean, I feel like today we're in a land where God said about Nineveh, they don't know the right hand from the left. And so we have a lot of people like that today, so they really need to hear about the message of hell. So if you're a person listening and you, know, you're, you don't call yourself a Christian, I just urge you to please listen because there's only two destinations and heaven is not our default destination. There needs to be a purposeful act on our part to enter heaven. You must repent and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior or you won't end up in heaven. You'll end up in this place called hell. And it's far worse than you could ever imagine. And then also, you know, for those of us that are saved, uh, I believe there's three reasons why it's important for us Christians to hear about this, even if you've heard it before. Number one, it causes us to appreciate much more maybe than we do our own salvations from what we were saved from. You know, a lot of Christians believe that, you know, there is no hell and so forth. But if you understand how severe hell is, you'll thank God he saved you from this horrible place. And number two, it causes us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord simply means that we will obey the Lord. We respect Him enough to obey Him. And not just part of the Word, but all of the Word. So it'll give you that, uh, you know, that holiness that you want to stand. You don't want to compromise and walk you know, in uh, a compromised lifestyle at all. And thirdly, it'll give us all more of a passion for the lost a desire to want to witness. You know, we do get comfortable and a little bit lazy. We go to church and hear a message, and that's great. But so many of us really don't watch for those opportunities to witness and say each day, Lord, use me today. Put me in front of somebody today where I could be an influence, you know, and have that heart, that passion after souls. Because God doesn't want one person to go to hell, but he uses us. But if we keep our mouth shut, you know, we're going to miss out on opportunities. You know, and again, most of our, uh, our witness is through our life example. You know, do we show up on time for work? Do we keep our word to our own hurt? Do we show love and forgiveness to people that are ugly to us, you know, or mean to us? And there's so many opportunities we can guard ourselves when we're in front of the unsaved to show godliness and not react the way our flesh would like to. And that influences them. So, you know, when you understand the severity of hell, you know, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, even though that scripture is talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, most commentaries agree that he was also talking about judgment and hell in general. So when you understand judgment and hell in general, you will be more persuasive with men. You'll take more effort. So before I share the vision God gave me, I want to share with you another vision of somebody that uh, affected me. And uh, you'll all know his name. And um, William Booth, who was the founder of Salvation Army. He was an English um, theologian and uh, preacher, Methodist preacher. He established the Salvation Army. He fed the food on a huge scale. And he preached holiness and walking in the fear of the Lord, and he preached about hell. But God gave him a vision, and I'm just going to read three minutes, an excerpt out of his vision. 
and it's really powerful. But he said, uh, I saw a dark and stormy ocean. Over it, the black clouds hung heavily. Every now and then, vivid lightning flashes and loud thunder and waves towered and would break again. In that ocean, I saw poor human beings plunging and floating, shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning. And I saw out of this dark, angry ocean a mighty rock that rose up with its summit towering high above the black clouds and stormy sea. All around the base of this great rock, I saw a vast platform. On this platform, I saw some of the poor, struggling people climbing up on the platform, and I saw a few of those who were already safe on the platform helping the people still in the angry waters to reach the place of safety. I noticed only a very few of those who were on the platform making it their business to get the people out of the sea. Some were industrially working using ladders, ropes, boats, and other means more effective to deliver those in the sea. Some even jumped into the water regardless of the consequences in their passion to rescue the perishing. What puzzled me the most was the fact that Though all of them had been rescued at one time or another from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten all about it. Those safe on the platform did not even seem to have any care, that is, any agonizing care about the poor perishing ones who were struggling and drowning right before their very eyes, and many of whom were their own husbands and wives, brothers, sisters, and even their own children. What was most amazing was that those on the platform did not listen to the cry that came to them from this wonderful being they confessed their love for and that they uh, professed to worship. They were so taken up with their trades and professions, their money, savings and pleasures, their families and friends, their religion and arguments about it, and their amusements. The occupants of this platform were absorbed in their own pursuits. Even though the drowning people were right there in full sight, and even though many attended church and heard lectures and sermons which the awful state of those poor drowning people were described, many were absorbed day and night in trading and business in order to make gain, storing up their savings. Then I saw that some of these people on the platform whom this wonderful being had called to, wanting them to come and help him in this difficult task of saving those who were perishing, were always praying and crying out to him to come to help them, help them, make them feel more secure and more happier in life. Then I understood it all. The sea was the ocean of life, the sea of real, actual human existence. The thunder was the distant echoing of the wrath of God. The lost were in the stormy sea of life, sinking and screaming, all sinners before God. The great rock represents Calvary, the place where Jesus had died for them. And those on the platform were those who had been rescued. There were only a few out of the many helping Jesus rescue the dying multitudes. The rest were too busy and distracted with their own lives. And, you know, let that not be us. Let us be the ones that are industriously working with ladders, ropes, and boats, and so forth to rescue those people out of the sea. You know, and I just want to read you just two um, uh, articles, two posts here. Uh, uh, August 24th of 21, there was an article, and it was called uh, Citing a Study by Probe Ministries titled Biblical beliefs nosedive as 60% of Christians under 40 say Jesus is not the only way to salvation. 60% of those under 40. And then also uh, a September uh, 10th, 21, a post from the Christian Post, a study from Arizona Christian University stated that only 6% of born-again evangelicals hold a biblical worldview. Only 6%. Anyway, so we see our church needs help, too, the body of Christ. And those that are unsaved really need to hear what they're going to be facing if they deny Jesus. You know, hell, like I said, is far more severe than anybody can imagine. And you wouldn't want your worst enemy to go there. Amen. Well, on November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that changed my life. 
And it doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Bible has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that's classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up in heaven in a vision, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, you can actually travel. Paul and John actually went to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 talks about a natural body and a spirit body. And, um, and the things experienced, like in Ezekiel chapter 8, he was picked up by his hair and carried from Babylon to Jerusalem in a vision. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. So my point is, the things experienced in your spirit body are just as real as they would be in your physical body. And this is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. The only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or a vision. And uh, I've been a Christian for 53 years now. And this happened when I was a Christian for 28 years, November 23, 1998. Uh, but Job 7.14 says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can have a terrifying vision. Isaiah 21.2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. And one more thing that was unique about this vision, God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. Uh, you say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? In Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary point out, quote, they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their minds, and he hid it from my mind for a reason which I will get to and explain. Well, we went to a prayer meeting Sunday night, like every Sunday night we attended this prayer meeting. Nothing unusual about the night. Uh, came home. Now, I had never studied the topic of hell at this point. Uh, I was a Christian for 28 years. I've never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I had never had a vision before. So we went to bed. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And I was walking through our living room, and something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body. I saw my body fall to the floor in the living room. And I started tumbling down this tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter and darker and darker. And then I passed through this open cavern-like area. And I landed on an actual stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough hewn stone walls, bars, filthy, stinking, dirty prison, but like a dungeon. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says, They shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, The earth with her bars was about me forever. So the Tyndale, the New International Commentaries, point out that Jonah himself was at the gates of hell and that it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's where I first found myself, face down on the floor. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat, far beyond the ability to sustain life. And I wonder, how could I be alive in this blast furnace? And so my reaction was I wanted to get up and run out of this prison cell. But I noticed I had no physical strength in my body. It took so much effort to move. But Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. So one of the things in hell you have to endure is no physical strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you just felt weak, it's a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts in the cell, creatures. They were demons, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, huge jaws, sunken in eyes. They had claws that were about a foot long. And these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that, but I'll keep moving. Um, they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal. They had the most ferocious demeanor about them. Then the one demon grabbed me and picked me up and threw me into the wall of this prison cell. Tremendous strength demons have. 
like I weighed the weight of a water glass. I hit the wall. I collapsed on the floor. I felt as if every bone had been broken in my body. Now, maybe a spirit doesn't have bones, but it sure felt that way. And, but I noticed, I have to explain one thing. I noticed that I was not feeling all the pain. I understood that I was being blocked. But on the way back, the Lord explained to me that he allowed me to feel a small amount of the pain so I could relate to people that it's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real, Amen. literal pain you're going to feel in hell. And so the amount I felt was enough. But then lying on the floor, this other demon that was in the cell picked me up from behind, grabbed me, and dug its claws into my chest and tore the flesh open. Again, I couldn't, I couldn't believe, how can I be alive through this? I should be dead. And I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about, he wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes to lift. He had a tongue. So you have a body in hell. But it withstands these torments. And um, I noticed there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. I just noticed it was all dry. But Leviticus 17, 11 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They hate you. But see, Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. They don't fear him in hell. So you don't derive the benefit of mercy. Now, about this time, it went dark. I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see, and he withdrew his attribute of light. So it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But, and it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel the darkness. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. See, it's so evil and wicked and penetrating black, it just seems to just penetrate through every cell in your body. I mean, it is so, you cannot see the hand in front of your face at all. I was taken out of this prison cell and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. It was God that took me, but I didn't know that then, and placed me next to this huge raging pit. I understood it was about a mile across in diameter and with flames raging high up into this open cavern, filled with fire. I mean, it was real, literal fire. I felt the heat. I saw the flames. But more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11.6 says, Upon the wicked he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, The angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Isaiah 33, 14, 12 through 14 says, The people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? That refutes annihilationism right there. Everlasting burnings. And there's many more scriptures on fire, but this is where I could first see people inside this pit. I could see through the fire. The flames does not travel. It's so dark it consumes the light, but I could see through the flames, and I could see the outlines of thousands of people. And they just look like skeletons. You cannot identify a man from a woman. And the people were screaming so loud. It was deafening. You want to get away from the screams. It's so, uh, I don't even know what the word is. It's agonizing to hear these screams. You know, but Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mind of any kind. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, My people dwell in a quiet resting place. Well, you're not his people. She don't enjoy the benefit of quiet. And to see people burning, most of us have never seen that. But it's really horrific to see a person on fire burning. You want to help them, but you can't, can't help yourself. Now, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that identify where the current hell is. The current hell is called Sheol or Hades. Sheol is the Hebrew word. Hades is the Greek word. So right now, hell is down deep in the earth. And um, I understood that. After Judgment Day, death and hell 
the current hell will be delivered up and cast into outer darkness and into the lake of fire, uh, Revelation 20, 12 through 15. But right now it's down deep in the earth, and I understood that. I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. Well, that infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is, there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is far worse than you can imagine. Now, I had a desire to talk to my wife. I wanted to just be able to say goodbye to her. I'll never see her again. I'll never get to tell her goodbye. I'll never get to tell her I love her, hold her. And see, Job 7, 9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You have that understanding. You'll never get out. And you have no finality with your family. You don't realize what a tormenting thought that is to not even say goodbye. You never had the opportunity to say, I love you, I'll miss you, I love you. you know, they don't even know you still exist. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist, you're just down deep in the earth. I wanted to talk to a person, right, just anybody. There's pleasure in being with people, even if you don't know them, conversation, but you're all kept at a distance from each other. In that pit of fire, they're all kept at a distance. You have no interaction with anyone. You're completely isolated all by yourself for all eternity. You'll never have another conversation with anybody. I mean, these are the things that you have to endure for all eternity, uh, being kept apart. You have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a, a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says your name is covered in darkness. You have no identity. And you're forgotten. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, Deuteronomy 32.26, Psalms 109.15, all explain that you're forgotten. You don't realize that's a tormenting thing because you know nobody up on the earth has given you a thought. You know, do you think about anybody in hell? No. You know, even if you're from another religion, uh, they usually will say at a funeral, well, they've gone to another place. Yet that's not the case. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many are going to hell and few are going to heaven. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors, worse than any open sewer or anything you've ever smelled. You know, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9:25. Demons have a foul, decaying, disgusting odor to them. But also the smell of, it smells like burning flesh and um, also burning sulfur. And if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point when you get up close to the volcano uh, because the fumes coming up are toxic. It's called sulfur dioxide. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is mentioned 14 times in the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, disgusting, putrid, toxic air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. You have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen so you feel like any moment you're going to suffocate. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. You see how specific God is with his word? So this is how you breathe in hell. It was like, that's as much air as you could get. So any moment you, you feel like you're going to suffocate. And that goes on for all eternity. There's, it's a place of confusion. Jeremiah 20, 11, Isaiah 45, 16 mentioned everlasting confusion. Uh, Job 10, 22, a land without any order. You know how we like things orderly, right? because we serve a God of order. Well, hell is the antithesis. It's hectic, crazy, confusion. Nothing makes any sense. So it, it, it's hard for me to get that across to you, that confusion that you're enduring in hell. It's a tormenting thing. And uh, I was standing next to this big pit of fire and demons were shoving people back into this pit uh, people were trying to claw their way out, but they really had, they had no strength to pull themselves out. But there were demons 
shoving them back in. There were individual pits of fire along, like I said, I only could see along the edges and through the flames. The light doesn't travel in hell. But along the edges, I could see individual pits. And some people were in the individual pit. Others were in the big pit. Some were in prison cells. But the people in the individual uh, pit, flames would rage up on them and burn all their flesh off. And they would scream in agony. And then it seemed to me, it looked like the flesh seemed to come back on their bodies. And then it would rage up again and burn it off again. Um, and it was just horrendous to see this and hear the, the screams of all these people. And I noticed I was standing, I looked and I saw snakes crawling all over everything. And I was standing on a solid bed of maggots. You know, Jesus said, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. He used the word maggot. And, you know, I never realized this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots here on the earth, after they consume the flesh, the maggots die. I never knew that, but they will die after they consume the flesh. Well, that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot is, will cover thee, and the, the maggot will be spread under thee, and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original. It's the word maggot. So it's real literal maggots. It's not tormenting thoughts. It's real maggots in hell. And uh, there were demons all along. I could see I was along these cavern walls, and there were demons of all different sizes and shapes along these walls. Two, some were only 2 and 3 feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. But they were all twisted, deformed, and grotesque. And they all had an extreme hatred for God and for man. And the ones I saw along the walls seemed to be chained to the walls. That's the way they appeared to me. I'm just telling you what I saw. And uh, they were clawing at me, trying to get at me, but they couldn't, and so forth. Um, the fear that I experienced in hell. You know, here we're nice and comfortable. But I'm going to try to relate to you the fear level that you feel. Because you're seeing all this terror. There's nobody to help you, nobody to rescue you. Uh, there's demons. There's people burning. Uh, the stench, all these things going on. And the fear in your throat is so intense and, uh, you know, most of us have gone through some kind of fear in life. Maybe even if you're in a car accident and the moment before the impact, <gasps> the fear that jumped up in your throat. Or maybe you're at war. Or maybe you were held up at gunpoint. Well, um, I used to surf when I was 17. And we were off Cocoa Beach, Florida. Big day, having a great time. About 100 guys out that day. And suddenly the guy next to me got his leg torn off. A shark came and grabbed it, ripped his leg off. Bled all over the water. So all of us guys got up on our knees trying to get our legs out of the water and then start paddling to the beach. But all of a sudden, sharks were everywhere, banging into our boards and all. And we were out about a quarter mile out. It breaks out real far when it's big, so it's going to take you a while to get to the beach. And uh, my buddy was knocked off his board. He's in the water. And I saw this shark go by my board, and it was longer than my nine-foot board. And it was a tiger shark because I saw the stripes on him. And he opened his mouth as he went by. And you can't believe how powerful those things look and how helpless you feel in the water when they pass by and their teeth are huge. There's nothing you can do. Well, that shark came back, bit my board in half and snapped it like it was a toothpick. And so I'm in the water now and my buddy looks at me and says, Bill, I, I guess we're dead. And not a good confession, but at the same time, that's how we felt. You're surrounded by sharks. Well, one of those big sharks came back, grabbed my leg, and pulled me down under the water. Suddenly, jerked me down under the water. Now, you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. Even if you haven't been through it, right? You can at least in your mind relate to that little. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register in hell. Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, You cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with this terror for all eternity. Now, praise God, a miracle happened that day. And the shark not only opened his mouth and let me go, but I didn't have a mark in my leg. That's impossible. God was looking out for me. And I was not even saved then. But I got saved immediately after that. So I did. We serve a good God, amen? 
I mean, he's, been looked, he's looked out for me and my wife, and, you know, uh, he's just been so good to us all these years, and, you know, I've got to enjoy my leg all these years. And, <laughs> and I probably would have died anyway. You know, it's just amazing. God is so good to us. Yes. You know, I, it's just no way to really describe to you the horrors. I try to paint a little bit of a picture for you of how bad hell really is. But it's way worse than that. I didn't even want to share this experience with anybody because I knew what I saw is far worse than any human being could ever describe. I don't care how gifted of a speaker I could become. It doesn't matter. It's worse than anything I could tell you. And uh, that's why it's so important for us to share the Word of God with people. We carry the words of life, you know, and 1 Thessalonians says he's entrusted us with the gospel. He has entrusted us with the words of life. That's really an honor for all of us as Christians that think God has trusted us with his precious word, words that would save someone. We don't have to rely on our own convincing people. It's the Holy Spirit that convinces them. We just have to open up our mouth. We do the easy part. God does all the hard part and convicts our hearts. He just wants us to be willing and say, Lord, use me. I'll do it. I'll go. Because we don't have a lot of time even left in this world right now. I believe we're in the last of the last days. Amen. So what we do for him, God will count for all eternity. You know? So we need to be uh, eternally minded. As I was looking at all this horror, um, I just want to share something else with you, though. I'm going to give you some scripture because there's some people that might think, Bill, come on, aren't you exaggerating hell? Demons tormenting people. I mean, isn't that your version? No, that's the Bible version. So can you bear with me for two minutes while I give you scripture about being tormented in hell? Is that okay? All right. Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. Who's doing the beating? Psalms 50, verse 22, you that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. Matthew 24, 51, I will cut him in pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116, 3, the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19, for what good is a day of the Lord to you, judgment day? It'll be darkness. And as a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Job 33, 22, his soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141.7, their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49.14, their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. Psalms 32.10, many sorrow shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78.49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. Deuteronomy 32, 22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. Matthew 22, 13, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. John 15, 6, if a man abide not in me, just as men gather branches that are withered, they are thrown into the fire and are burned. Luke 12, 4 and 5, don't fear him who is able, who is after he has killed the body, has no more he can do. Rather, fear him who is after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. I say to you, fear him. Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark 9, 43, if your hand or foot or eye offend thee, cut them off. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than in the hell fire, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Luke 12, Luke 16, 23, where the rich man was in hell and torment in the flames and wanted a drop of water. And Matthew 13, 40 says, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and cast them into a furnace of fire where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 23, 33, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? He just told them they can't escape it. And one more verse, Psalm 74, 20 says, For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Full of the habitations of cruelty. The word cruelty, look it up in the Strong's Concordance, number 2555. It's the word Hamas. 
We've all heard that word before, right? The terrorist group Hamas. The word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. That's what you're experiencing in hell. You say, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, Jesus said why. Matthew 25, 41, he said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this place. But he used the word prepared. The same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven or make ready. So what he did in the preparation was, you see, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. All the good we enjoy in life comes from God. It's not automatic. The fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good comes from God. So what he did in the preparation, he was preparing hell, he withdrew his attributes or his goodness. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1.5 said, God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1.4 said, God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4.16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36.5 says the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18.32 said it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11.11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9.6 says he is the Prince of Peace. So see, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. So if you're a person in life that says, I don't want anything to do with God, well, fine. There's a place prepared that has nothing to do with Him. Other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the scripture, it says He will pour out His wrath on sin in the form of fire. So the fire is from God. But God poured out His wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So we can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. Your choice. So when people look at the mountains, the trees, the ocean, they say, oh, isn't Mother Nature wonderful? Yeah. No, that's not Mother Nature. That's Father God that provided all that. Right? Psalms 33, 5 says, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We get to enjoy His goodness while we're here in life. But if we reject Him, then we go to a place where he's withdrawn his goodness. A person's own free will. As I was looking at all this horror, demons shoving people back in this pit, all that, I began ascending up this tunnel. These walls that were around me, something began lifting me up and I was ascending up this tunnel. And in this pitch black darkness, suddenly this bright light appeared. I knew immediately who it was. I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure, holy light, like no light I have ever seen. But when Jesus shows up, there's no doubt who he is. I just called out his name. I said, Jesus. And he just said two words. He said, I am. When he said, I am, I went out. I don't know if I died or passed out. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. So I was at his feet. But after a time, he touched me, and I came to. And it hit me so strongly when I was at his feet. Even though I've been a Christian for 28 years, I thought, if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I was so grateful for the cross. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving your life for me, Jesus. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for going to the cross, Lord. Thank you for enduring all that pain for me to keep me out of hell. Thank you, Jesus. And I just kept saying that. But after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind. And he would answer my thoughts. I didn't want to ask him a question, but he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I first thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Now, at the time, that surprised me. I thought, wait a minute, don't all Christians believe in hell? But we have found out since, like I said, many people believe in universalism, annihilationism, soul sleep. Universalism is a teaching that says everybody goes to heaven eventually. And that's true. Many scholarly Christians believe this and teach this today. 
at our universities. Or annihilationism. That's a teaching that says if you, if you don't know Jesus, you just simply are annihilated. You just don't exist. And that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the same word everlasting as the word ionios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. It says the same thing in John 5, 29. Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2, Acts 24, 15, Matthew 13, 30, Revelation 14, 10. Many verses point out that hell is eternal. Jesus made it clear. It's eternal. It's the same word used about the everlasting God, Romans 16, 26, and many other verses. So it's, it's a place of eternal torment. I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, they hated me before they hated you. See, demons hate God, but they can't hurt him. But they can hurt his creation. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So all the evil, destruction, sickness, disease, poverty, all that comes from the demonic realm. It doesn't come from God. So many people falsely accuse God when the, a sickness happens or a, a young, a little baby dies, well, God took him. No, God didn't take him. He's not the killer. Anyway, uh, I thought, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I will go. But I have to admit, after this experience, I came back. I didn't really want to share this experience with anybody. I wanted to witness like crazy, but I didn't want to share the experience because I thought people would think I'm, I'm crazy. And I didn't need that. I have a real estate company. I was doing well. And what do I need that for? And, uh, but I knew the Lord was telling me to go. So I told my best friend what happened. And uh, he invited me to a Bible study. I didn't want to go. I went reluctantly three months later. Well, it spread from there. And we were getting invited all over the country. There was no book then. And so I knew God was telling me to go, even though I didn't want to go. Um, and we traveled. We paid our own way for seven years. We never took one penny from anybody. Uh, we didn't want anybody to say, you're doing this for the money. And I complained, though, to the Lord for seven years. I said, Lord, I, I'm uncomfortable doing this. I'm too conservative. And he said, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Man, that hit my heart. I said, I'm sorry, Lord. I repent. I'm happy to do what you want me to do. You know, sometimes God pulls us out of our comfort zone. But if we'll be obedient, you know, we'll become comfortable. And it doesn't even matter if I'm uncomfortable. If one person can come to the light of the scripture and avoid this horrible place, then it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel. Right? Amen. You know, but God's given us all something to do. Every one of us are equally important. There are no big shots with God. So I just encourage you, whatever God's told you to do, that could be anything. Just do it with all your strength and all your might because he's given you an ability that I don't have. You can reach people that I can't reach. So I just encourage you to do it. Be available for God. And like I said, you know, uh, he, you know he's going to count what you do for all eternity. You know, never forget what you do. I thought, Lord, why didn't I know you? Remember I told you he blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. Well, he said, because if you would have known me, you would have had hope. You see, if I, I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I would have known. Praise God, he's getting me out of here. Yeah. I would have known that, right? Because we know our, our destiny is heaven. But he wanted me to feel what they feel, hopelessness. See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And we don't realize here on the earth what it's like to be totally hopeless. I mean, even if you're dying of pain, you understand you can die to get out of the pain. You will escape it. Well, in hell, you know you'll never escape it. And there's no one to come rescue you. There's no Calvary coming over the hill. There's no friend to ever talk to. You understand you will never, ever escape this place. I just want that to sink into you for a moment. 
because that was the worst part of hell. Yeah. Understanding 100 million years will go by and it's still day one. Jesus. I'll never get out. Can you see why this decision is so important yeah. and people slough it off and say, oh, I can think about it later. You don't realize, even if you're hearing me now, you don't realize that you can't even come to God unless God draws you. John 6, 44. You can't even come to him on your own. He has to be drawing you. So this is not an invitation. This is an opportunity for people to get saved. Because you can turn down an invitation. But you have to look at this as an opportunity. It might not come tomorrow. You could be killed tomorrow. And you'd, you'd have an eternity. Just think about the, the thief on the cross. He went with Jesus, but the other one is in hell for all eternity. And he was right next to the Savior. All he had to do is call out like the other thief. And he's got eternity to think about his foolish decision. We went above the earth in this whirlwind tunnel. Scripture for that, but I'm just going to keep moving. And um, the Lord had me look back at this tunnel we came out of. And people were falling one after another, after another, after another, back down into hell. And he allowed me to feel just a piece of his heart. The anguish he feels for a soul falling into hell. I couldn't stand it. I said, Lord, stop. I can't take even a little piece of your heart for the anguish you feel for a soul falling into hell. See, Ephesians 3.19 says, His love passes knowledge. He loves us far more than we are able to love our own loved ones. Far more. And just to give you a quick scripture that the Lord opened up to me, in Psalms 139, 17 and 18, David said, Your thoughts toward me are all precious, and I suppose if I should count them, they are more than the sands. Now, another scripture in Psalms says, More than the sands on the whole earth. Now, that's not an exaggeration, because God can't exaggerate. But think about that. He said, Your thoughts toward me are all precious, and I suppose if I should count them, they're, they're more than the sands. Now, if I was to pick up a handful of sand, there'd be thousands of granules, right? If each little granule represented a thought, and I thought, boy, I love how my wife prays for me all the time. I love how she prays for her parents. I love how she is so beautiful. I love how she prays for her friends. You come back three or four hours from now, and I'm trying to exhaust them out of my hand. You would say, Bill is really crazy about his wife, right? That's just to exhaust him out of my hand. But God said his thoughts toward each one of us are more than the granules of sand on the whole earth. And, that, and like I said, it's not an exaggeration because God can't exaggerate. How many sands are on the whole earth? There's no way to ever count the trillions and trillions. That's how much he loves each person. So he doesn't want to see a person go to hell. He's trying to keep people out of hell. So you might say, but Bill, you know, I'm a good person. How can a loving God send a good person to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But see, if you're going to go by the standard of good, then you have to go by God's standard. Yes. See, God's standard is different than ours. You might be pretty good compared to people. But James 2.10 says, if we offend God's law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. If we, have one, if we steal one thing, 1 Corinthians 6.9 says, no thief will inherit heaven. If we have one lustful thought, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery and no adulterer will inherit heaven. That's just three of the Ten Commandments. So if we're going to be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? Guilty. We'd all be guilty. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If you have one foolish thought your entire life, that would exclude you from heaven. Man, that's a high standard, isn't it? So none of us can stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me in. He's going to say, no, not, not according to my standard. Matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ, because none of us would make it. But you might not be convinced yet. You might be like a secular radio talk show host I was on with that was invited. It was syndicated across America. And they said, Bill, watch your back with this guy. He does not like Christians. And he will spit you off the air in about a minute. So I went on the air, and he says, okay, Christian, don't you quote me one Bible verse on my airways. I don't want to hear none of that Bible. You got it? I said, okay, okay. He said, I submit to you that you Christians are unreasonable because you don't consider my viewpoint. He said, my viewpoint is just as valid as yours, and I'm a good person, and I should be let into heaven. If your God doesn't let me into heaven, then he's actually guilty of a hate crime. 
That's what he said. He said, so what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? Well, what do you say? You're live on the air, and I can't give scripture. I said, well, let me give you an analogy. God just dropped an analogy in my mind right at that moment. Thank God. I said, okay, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country, and you knocked on their door, and you said, oh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? You have no relationship with them. Wouldn't expect them to. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as a son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. <laughs> what, is good, what does good have to do with it? You don't know him. I said, see, I said, God offered to be your father. He offered to be your father throughout your whole life, but you pushed him away. You said, I don't want you as my father. See, God is your creator. He's not your father to invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Galatians 3, 26, John 1, 12, John 8, 44, Romans 9, 7, and 8, John 17, 9, Ephesians 5, 1, all explain that he's your creator. He's not your father to you invite him in. So I said, that's unreasonable of you to expect to live in someone's house that you don't even know. So he says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right, and I think that all roads lead to heaven. That's what I think. I said, okay, all roads lead to heaven. Let me give you another analogy, which God gave me <laughs> on the spot. <laughs> God's so good. I said, okay, narrow. We're narrow-minded, and you think all roads lead to heaven. I said, say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. Well, you're going to tell me, Bill, you're not going to get to my house. I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. Same thing. God gives us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives. Right? All we have to do is follow his clear directions. That's not narrow-minded. That's specific. He's given us specific, clear directions on how to get there. You know, people think God's up there arbitrarily saying, well, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically on the road to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 explain that because we're all born in sin, Psalms 51, 2. So that's different than being sent there. We're already going. That's why Jesus came, was to plan a cross on that road that we're all on. So all we have to do is look up to the cross, trust in what he did on the cross, repent of our sin, and receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and he'll take us off that road. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. He says, well, can't God overlook my sins? I mean, I don't kill anybody. That's the other misconception. If you don't kill anybody, you're good enough for heaven, you know. And I said, no, for two reasons God cannot overlook our sins. Number one, he's a just judge. And a good judge would not be considered good in our land here if he just let the criminal go free, if he didn't punish the crime. Well, our sin has to be punished. But Jesus took that punishment for us. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. But number two, he cannot overlook our sins because Hebrews 12, 29 and Nahum 1, 5 said God is a consuming fire. And it says in Nahum 1, 5 that all of us would be consumed at his presence. In our fallen nature, we would be consumed. So see, it's like this. If I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and the fire burned my hand, I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn me? That was mean of that fire. I wouldn't say that, would I? Why? Because the nature and fire, uh, my hand is not compatible with fire. The same with a holy God is not compatible with sinful man. If we show up in his presence, we'd be consumed. So how can man ever come before a holy God? Only one way. If someone came and lived the perfect life and never sinned once, not even one foolish thought, and that's Jesus Christ. And he stands before the Father and says, I've never sinned. I will exchange my righteousness with them if they trust in what I'm doing on the cross. See, Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So if we would trust in the work of the cross, then he considers our trust as if we were righteous. And he takes our sin, washes them away with our, his blood. So now we can stand before holy God because we trusted in the cross. He gives us that new nature that's compatible with a holy nature of God. Gives us a new heart and a new spirit. 
Now we can enter heaven. Isn't that an amazing plan that God came up with? You know, some people say, you know, I don't like this one-way business you Christians have. You ought to be grateful there is a way. He made a way where there was none. Thank God. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You want to live at his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. But you say, Bill, I just don't believe that. Well, I have a verse for you then. Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. There's the warning. He just told you, if you don't believe me, you will end up in the lake of fire. I'm trying to keep you out. But people say, I don't believe that Jesus is the only way. That's why you could see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you. Because you said, I don't believe Jesus is the only way. So your own words send you to hell. God's not sending anybody. But, and because he loves us, he gives us the free will to choose. Yes. He says, here's how you stay out. Here's how you get to heaven. Your choice. How can anybody be mad at God or accuse him uh, of being mean? He's the one that died a horrific death on the cross to keep us out of hell and take us to heaven. It's just that simple. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. You know, Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book. And he's going to look to see if our names are in his book. And the worst words you could ever hear at Judgment Day, him saying, your name's not in this book. And then he'd have to say, depart from me into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. He wouldn't want to say those words. But again, because he loves you, he gives us a free will to choose. You know, when the Titanic set sail, there were all different beliefs on that ship, all different religions, all different walks of life, and they say there were three classes of people, the lower, the middle, and the upper class. But when the ship went down at the White Star Line office in Liverpool, England, there were two signs posted, and the people would wait anxiously each day as a man would come out to write one of their relatives' names down on one of the signs. One sign said, known to be saved. The other one said, known to be lost. Now, when the ship left, all different beliefs, all different religions, all different walks of life, and three classes of people. But the end, there's only two. You're either saved or you're lost. And it's your choice. You know, if you're listening today, please, I urge you, don't take a chance with your soul. It is eternal, and you will spend it in one place or the other. Amen. And you've got to re repent and receive Jesus if you want to go to heaven. Otherwise, you be will be in hell forever, and it'll be your own fault. You might say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book. I'm not certain. And I don't know if I've ever really repented. This is the clear directions to heaven. John 3.36 says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. How do you know the Son? Just two verses. Luke 13.3, Jesus said, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. What does repent mean? That means to have a change of mind where you have a humble heart and you say, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself but I'm willing to turn away from sin and follow Jesus. It's not enough to mentally assent to the fact and say, yeah, I can believe Jesus is God. I believe that. And go do your own thing. That's not repentance. It's turning from sin and turning to follow God. That takes a, some humility to do that. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe him in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. That's the only way to be saved. That's the clear directions to heaven. So if you're here today and you say, Bill, I don't know if I've ever really repented. I may be mentally assented to it, but I've never really asked Jesus into my heart. Or maybe you just haven't really committed your life to Jesus. Or maybe you're living backslidden and you want to get your life right with God. But if you want assurance that your name is written in his book, 
I'm going to ask at the count of three to raise your hand if there's anybody here that would say, I don't know for certain my name's in his book, but I want it to be. If that's you, at the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And online, you can do this yourself. One, two, three. Thank you, Lord. Any hands? I see your hands. I see your hands. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. I know it takes some guts to raise your hand, but most of us have done this already. And you want to make sure God sees that hand because he said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. You want to make sure he sees that hand, he writes your name in his book. That's the most important book your name could ever be in. If everybody would stand to their feet, I'm just going to invite each person that raised their hand. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come forward. And again, this takes some guts, but this shows God you're serious. You're not doing this half-heartedly. Come, come forward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. You know, it says all of heaven celebrates over one. You're precious to God, every one of you. He would have given his life for just one of us. This is the most important decision you could ever make. And this is just the beginning. It's the wisest decision you ever made. We're going to say a prayer, and we can all say this prayer out loud. You know, if there's anybody else just going to take another 30 seconds or so, I don't want anybody in this room to go to hell or even online. Uh, if you're online, you're going to say this prayer with us, okay? And then you maybe can get a hold of the church and let them know what you've done with your life. And um, receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Such a beautiful sight. Praise God. Amen. Yes. Praise God. You all are so beautiful. I'm telling you. You have no idea what you look like to us as Christians. It's like, wow, Lord, these people are going to go to heaven and for all eternity. You know? And it took the whole church praying for you. And not just me speaking. It's then this church been praying for your soul to get saved. People that don't even know you, that pour out their heart for God, towards God, that it, God would touch your heart. Only God can do this. And we're so grateful. All right, we're going to say a prayer, and these words are going to change your eternity. And it'll come from your heart, but just repeat after me, okay? And we can all say this out loud. You guys ready? Yes. Say, Dear God in heaven, Dear God in heaven I, know I know that I've sinned, and I cannot save myself. I, save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus, you your son Jesus to die on a cross, on a cross for, me, for me, that he was crucified, he was crucified died and was buried, and was buried but rose again, rose again, and lives forevermore. Forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. I repent. I want to follow you. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you for taking me to heaven. I now confess I'm a born-again Christian going to heaven. Fill me now with your spirit that I would speak in tongues and magnify your holy name. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for taking me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Praise God. 